singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. Today, my guest on the show would be Nigel Auckland. Nigel is uh, this absolutely extraordinary person that I met at the Global Future Conference um, uh, in New York um, about a week or, or so ago, who had this, uh, I would say, in my opinion, the most moving presentation of all the presentations there. And it was titled, Ordinary, Extraordinary, Life with a Bionic Arm. So, uh, welcome to Singularity One on One, Nigel. I'm so happy to have you here. Thanks for having me. And uh, you forget, um, I'm ordinary. I'm not extraordinary. <laughs> well, I, I think we are going to debate uh, that perhaps a little bit later because you're trying to pass yourself as an ordinary person, and perhaps you are, but the effect that you accomplished on the audience in the hall was not ordinary. You managed to move me. I'm not a, uh, an easy person to move. Uh, and many of the people sitting next to me, I was watching them. And that, my friend, in my opinion, is not an ordinary thing. That's absolutely extraordinary because none of the other very experienced speakers, very intelligent and smart, smart people manage to do that. So it takes more than intelligence or scientific knowledge to be able to uh, reach across the seats and the aisle and, and communicate in that way with people. So I, I beg to differ with you. <laughs> On Thank that. You. Thank you. Now, Nigel, um, if you were to describe yourself in your own words, you claim you're an ordinary person. Tell us, who are you? Um, well, I, I had a profile once which just said, old, bold, with a face like a slap bar. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm an ordinary guy. I, seriously, I, or, I, I walk my dog, I, I shop. And, you know, I, I live like ordinary, everyday people, you know. I'm just, uh, I'm retired uh, due to uh, the, the injuries, etc. Um, but other than that, I'm just like everyone else you meet in the street, really. Uh, can you tell us uh, what was the, the job that you retired from, perhaps? <clears throat> yeah, I was a, a precious metal smelter, so basically we'd uh, throw a, an awful lot of material into a, a large rotary furnace, melt it down, and pour off the precious metals. Um, that, that was my job. Um, Is that gold and platinum and things like that? Yeah. Um, the area that I was working was predominantly silver. But silver. Uh, obviously, any any sort of precious metals that you get, you're going to refine it further and take the gold out, take the platinum out, the rhodium, etc. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And... Uh, would you would you mind sharing with us perhaps how uh, did the injury come about? If it's not too hard, perhaps. No. Um, well, basically, myself and a colleague were set to to clean out uh, a rotary blender, uh, just a, a huge drum, and we've been doing this for most of the day, not a problem. And we were just come to the last little piece, clearing up. Uh, my friend was inside the drum, and he was pushing the materials to me, I was leaning into the drum and shoveling it out. And then the drum started to spin. I've no idea why, um, but it, it just started to spin. And as it spun, because I was leaning in, it lifted me off my platform and I tumbled into the drum. Uh, unfortunately, I, as I spun my arm, went up underneath some steel, the drum stopped and then came back the other way. And as it came back, obviously, it uh, took me here and just ripped all this, uh, ripped it off, um, left me hanging. I was hanging like this for, for about 45 minutes. Uh, obviously, I, I didn't want anyone to try and get me out until the experts were there in case my arm came off. Um, so I waited till they got there. But they couldn't get me out. Um, due to the location, etc., they, they, they were finding it difficult to, to free me. And a, a guy threw me a screwdriver, and I dug myself out, um, just sort of attacked myself with a, 
a screwdriver and then just free my arm and then climb down. You you mean you use the screwdriver to separate? Yeah, to take take my arm away from the between the the wall of the drum and the angle iron. Any residue, and I was just trying to dig myself out effectively. What happened with your friend? He was sitting underneath underneath me, uh, you know, trying to hold me up and support me because obviously I was uh, like I said, I was I was hanging from one hand mm -hmm. or from from just the injury, and he was trying to support my weight from underneath me. Mm -hmm. Was he okay? Did he have any injury himself? Um, I think I think the injuries to, to Chris were probably psychological. Uh, he had no physical injuries, but uh, I think I think this will haunt him for possibly for the rest of his life. Yeah, but that sounds to me like post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, when I was in the army, I, I've seen that happen too. Uh, to people who have no injuries but uh, have witnessed certain things and then it ends up that they carry it for the rest of their lives. Yes, so um, I've been there. Sometimes it's it's tougher than, than the actual physical injuries, they say. It is because, I mean... Or at least on parallel. If, if you don't have, have a physical injury, yeah, it, it must be what well, it is. It is difficult. I mean, I've been through post-traumatic stress that disorder and... Uh, yeah, it's, it's not a good place to be. It really isn't a good place to be. Okay, so let's move on from that from that moment then um, into the future. Um, and 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 so what what happened next? How did you end up connecting to uh, uh, RSL's cheaper company and and getting one of the most advanced and perhaps the most advanced bionic hands in the world? Um. Fortunate, really. I think um, I had an awful lot of trouble getting a, a standard prosthetic to fit because my stump is not a, a standard shape. Um, and at the time, the the resources that, and the technology around wouldn't really allow me to have a, a, a decent socket. And as I said, the GS two hundred four five. In my opinion, this is this is the most important part. Because, you know, if this is uncomfortable, if it hurts to put pressure on it, if you can only wear it for an hour a day, it doesn't matter what, what that does, that will stay on the shelf. So, um, I had trouble with these and consequently couldn't wear very much in the way of prosthetic. Um, my hospital prosthesis did try and, uh, help me with that. And, excuse me one second. He, sure. He made me this little thing. Oh. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, a good couple of inches shorter. So, but that that was the best one he ever made me. Uh, mm -hmm. Bless him. Uh, really good. Are um, they both custom molded to the shape of your sort of stump? Um, the one I just showed you, the pink one, that's um, that's old school. It's uh, a pretty uh, semi rigid inner liner, whereas this one is uh, a soft silicon liner. Mm -hmm. So slightly different, and the way I put this on is just a push. With that one, I had to try and pull my arm on. So um, this is definitely far superior to, to my old one. Um, I found myself in a situation where I could afford to buy this piece, um, and a company in England uh, called Dorset was the orthopedic. Um, Mark, the prosthesis there, made me a, a really good socket, um, and it, it fits fits so well. Um, and then I think he had a call from the company saying, we're looking for somebody. And because I was using a, a myoelectric uh, hook, um, he put my name forward and said, you know, this guy uses his all the time. Just give him a call. And they uh, they gave me a call and the rest is well, history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so... Tell us uh, just a little bit more about the, the connection. Is it vacuum attaching to? Do you remove the air from the inside or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me try and get it for Okay, this white thing here, this is a, a like a one-way valve. Mm -hmm. So obviously as I push my arm into the, the liner, mm -hmm. the air in there is displaced through that valve and, and gives me a, like a, a suction almost uh -huh. back. Very smart. And, 
and then the shape of this behind the elbow, it, uh, it just allows it to hook behind the bones of the elbow joint, and that's, uh, that gives you an extra bit of support. Mm -hmm. you, you've mentioned already that you had the myoelectric hook before that. Can you tell us a little bit more about the principle and, and the, the sort of the skill level that you require in order to control the functionality of the hand? Um, if you can uh, consistently control two separate muscles, one after the other, one after the other, on demand, and then occasionally contract both muscles at the same time on demand, you can control one of these. Um, the, the rest of it's just practice. Uh, I was operating this probably within less than a minute. Once we'd set the thresholds on the uh, on the laptop mm -hmm. and actually set the threshold levels with the software, this was just bang bang working, changing grip, no problem whatsoever. And then you just spend a little bit of time fine tuning. Mm -hmm. So when you, uh, you when you say that uh, you had to set the levels on the laptop, you mean the sort of the sensitivity of the nerve input output electric signals, perhaps? Exactly. Yeah. The uh, you have the software in the hand. You have the software like a software package on a, a laptop, mm -hmm. and you've got it right. You can just control the level of uh, the speed that the hand opens and closes, uh, and again the, the threshold levels because I'm using proportional grip. So the harder I squeeze, the more signal, the more signal, the faster the hand moves. Um, I tend to have mine on full speed all the time, mm -hmm. uh, just because that's me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you said you learned it very quickly, probably in a couple of minutes, because I, I was going to ask you if you're aware of a technology called haptic passive learning technology. I was just interviewing uh, the lead tech guy between Google Glass yesterday, and one of his other projects that he does, uh, he has this musical haptic passive learning glove that you put over your hand, and while you're talking or doing anything else, in the background, the glove moves your fingers in a way that, say, you play a Beethoven or, let's say, for release, uh, and, and it teaches you passively, without you paying attention or even thinking about it or knowing it, to play the piano for example. And one of the, the other applications that he was talking about was people who have undergone uh, some kind of, uh, let's say, spinal cord injury or other problems and they're unable to control their, um, their limbs or who have ampu uh, amputations and have trouble operating their uh, prosthesis. With this device, you teach them passively very quickly to to learn to control certain kinds of things. And that's called haptic it's passive. It's called haptic passive learning. That sounds so cool. And it was amazing because uh, they did a test during which uh, they tested, I think, 16 graduate students to try to teach them to play like a music, uh, musical melody or something while the guys were undergoing their graduate studies exam. So it's almost like subliminal muscle memory. It, exactly. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And, and so, I, I guess that it would fool the brain into perhaps making the, or remaking the, the, the nerve connections on an amputated limb or whatever. It would make that a lot faster to, to get back. Exactly. So it, it accelerates that uh, uh, speed of adaptation and or, in some cases, recovery. That's something worth looking at. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll check that out. Absolutely. <laughs> so I told him I'll be interviewing you today, and he said, ask him if he knows about that and if, he was, if it was very hard for him to learn to operate his prosthesis. Now, uh, he's working with somebody else, though, who has the, the hand amputated from the shoulder onwards. Yeah, that's much more complicated. In that case, it's, it's, I think, much more complicated. It requires much steeper curve of learning. And I think in that case, uh, and the nerves found sort of in the shoulder area, I don't know if they're harder to, to get or I, I don't know the exact science, but he was saying that it, it, it helps a lot with the, with the learning process. I can imagine because I think you fire uh, a shoulder amputation, you probably fire it off from your chest or, or your back muscles. Yeah, something um, like that. Yeah, I can imagine that could be really, really good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway, um, 
I just thought uh, I'd share this with you because you'd find it interesting. Uh, let me ask you about some of the capabilities that, that the hand is giving you now. Can you, for example, write with your hand? I'm left-handed. You're left-handed. Oh, yeah. you're lucky. Yeah. yeah. That's very cool because, yeah. you know, uh, some people are ambidextrous. Some people are... I, I cannot write with my left hand, for example. No, I, I, I could do no writing at all with my right hand, uh -huh. you know, even before I lost it. But uh, as I said, in New York, uh, a guy in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, um, Celso Macarenas, now he has two uh, limbs like this. I'm, I'm not sure whether the the Bionic 3 or the Bionic 2, mm -hmm. but he wears a pair of them. And he's a professional artist, and he uses... His bionic hands when he when he does his artwork. Yeah, that's amazing. He, he's really cool. That's amazing. Um, how about uh, things like uh, issues with water? Can you wash your hands? Can you go in the shower and use the hand, or is it uh, not waterproof yet? Um, as it stands, it's not waterproof. Um, obviously, you do have a silicon cover mm -hmm. that you can put on. Uh, I think even within that, the 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 company that makes the covers suggests that you don't fully immerse yourself in, in a bath. Um, it's sort of splash proof. Uh, when I want to wash, I use a, a, a flannel, a cloth, damp cloth, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I can clean my hands quite, quite all right with that. Mm -hmm. Nigel, let me ask you this. From your own personal point of view, what are the major benefits of having your hand? Are they physical or psychological? Going back to our previous discussion. Um, I, I, for me, I would say the benefits have been more psychological. Um, don't get me wrong, the hand does everything that I expect it to do every time I ask it to do it. Uh, and if it doesn't do what I ask it to do, it's because I've told it wrong. But, you know, nothing else. But I think the difference is when you walk down the street with this on, and when I walk down the street with my hook, it's uh, it's such a different reaction. Um, the hook, uh, even my grifer, which is is kind of cool. This is this is my grifer, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's kind of neat. It's very functional, mm -hmm. um, very strong, mm -hmm. very practical. <laughs> but you should shake hands with it. Uh -huh. probably, probably not. It's not. It's not. No, it's not. I wouldn't shake hands with this. If someone offered this to me, I'd, I'd step back. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, that's the, that's the major hurdle that this is, this is overcoming. It, this breaks down barriers. The hook puts barriers up. You know, you, you see someone walk into the street with a hook towards you, and you know, I can totally understand how people. I'm not sure how to react. I can totally understand that because prior to losing this, I wouldn't have known how to react. You know, and for sure, you know, if I saw somebody walking down the street with this, I would stop and stare. No two ways about it. You know, it's one of those things. But the difference is people will come and talk to me about this. This, they accept it. I mean, it, Little children, they love this. They, they'll come up and they, they just think it's amazing. Once they get over the initial, the initial fear, because it's a bit, it is a bit spooky. But then they'll come and they'll, 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 you know, just like Doctor Ishiguro, you know, they'll check everything and bend all the fingers around and see what it does. And they're, they're really good. They're actually better than adults. Do they think? Do they ask you if you're like Robocop or Superman or something? Uh, never Superman. Um, I just get called robot or bionic man. Oh wow! Um, and yeah, I mean, like I said, the kids are more more accepting than the the adults. The adults are getting better. Mm -hmm. I mean, since uh, since the Paralympics and and everything that was going on there, I think they've, they've come to accept that yeah, because you've got maybe a piece missing, you, you're not different to anyone else really. You know, you're slightly different silhouette. Mm -hmm. and that's about it. I have to say, I've shaken your hand, and I'll remember that experience. And it was a very, I don't even know how to describe it, but it was touching for me. It was like, 
Um, yeah, I, I felt like I connected with you. It was strange. I can There's see. a real handshake. Exactly. And, and maybe even more because I actually, uh, sometimes, you know, you shake hands so quickly you don't really pay attention. We actually stayed connected for a few seconds and I, I felt we connected kind of. It was very strange. I remember that. I'll remember, uh, probably I'll re- I remember your handshake better than anyone's ever. Oh, it's so nice to say. And, you know, how do you think it felt for me? I must have shaken hands with, oh gosh, perhaps a thousand people at that weekend. Mm-hmm. And that's never happened to me before. Mm-hmm. So for me, you know, you felt what you felt. I felt that a thousand times over. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Would you- would you say that those people at the Global Future 24, 2045 conference were sort of more open-minded or more welcoming than, say, the average person that sees you on the street? Or was there no difference in your view? I think the, the GF crowds, because they are, they've got a better link towards science and technology, et cetera, et cetera, I think they probably would find it easier to approach me. But I had people, I had people two miles away from the, the conference center at half past 11 at night mm-hmm. calling my name out across the street asking to see my handwork. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was just crazy, absolutely crazy. But a wonderful, wonderful experience. It's, it's, um, it's like an acceptance. It's like being back in the fold again, if you understand. So that, I, I can see how from your point of view that benefit that sort of ability to establish connection rather than put up barriers, as you said, would be incredibly more beneficial than anything physical. Exactly. It, it, it is. I mean, the, you know, the hand that I have is beautiful um, and it's changed my, my life in, in so many ways. Mm-hmm. It will never replace this one. That's the reality. Or it will never. At the moment, we don't have what it takes to replace this. I do think that in a few years, I do think in a few years, hands maybe take a little bit longer than legs, but in a few years' time, um, particularly in sport, you're going to see so many changes. If they allow the technology to continue, if the, the political powers that be don't set limits, on the technology available to the Paralympians. Yeah, watch out, Mr. Bob. Your record's going to go. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. That, that was actually one of my follow-up questions, because doesn't that open the door that, in fact, the Paralympics may become so much more interesting than the normal Olympics, because records would be broken, speeds would be broken, uh, accomplishments would be broken, and it would be so much more interesting and newer and, and just unique. Exactly. I mean, imagine a guy doing a, a 50-foot high jump. <laughs> I mean, come on. No, I think it will get to the stage where it, it, will, um, it will challenge the Olympics for popularity. Uh, I think the technology will become so good that, you know, Paralympians and even the, the, you know, your average amputee that might want to run around a running track at home, they'll be outperforming normal humans, if you like. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they will. Now then, that raises the question though. Once the Paralympians become many times more powerful and capable, do you not think that there may be professional athletes or people who want to go for those kinds of accomplishments who would volunteer to have that kind of advanced prosthesis that would allow them to to accomplish those things rather than remain meagerly human and, and remain with that very fine limiting biological constraint? A hundred percent they will. They will. Um, because the moral framework that we, we operate in uh, isn't strong enough to perhaps outweigh the financial benefits of becoming the fastest person on the world or the highest jumper on the world or, you know, quite literally in a swimming pool, maybe a human torpedo. You know, there's when you get to those levels, the, the financial remuneration is so vast that um, 
I, I can yeah definitely see that people w- would want to or augment themselves purely to advance their their own wealth or power or whatever. Yeah, it's going to happen. Um, Do you think that's a good thing? Screen? Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing in your view? It's that's it's a tough one. Um, I think if I had my four limbs and you said to me, "Chop your right arm off." And I'll give you one of these. No. If you said to me in a few years' time, cut your arm off and I'll give you one of these, I probably would still waver and say no, because it's not in my makeup to go that way. If I were a professional sportsman, and you said, hey, give me your legs and I'll take five seconds off your 100 metre time, well, that's my life sorted, effectively. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, so there is a, a moral aspect, and I think that will be down to the individual. Mm-hmm. But it's going to happen. It's, I'm, I'm sure it's going to happen. Uh, I mean, it will start for the benefit. I hope. I hope it will start for the benefit of others. Mm-hmm. You know, rather than um, rather than just happen to increase a sportsman's chance of winning or or whatever. I hope it's if these elective amputations and that. Elective amputations happen all the time now, but now they seem to be happening for the right reasons. And I think to to cut your legs off just to run a bit faster doesn't sit right with, with me. Well, Oscar Pistorius, putting aside his current personal troubles, Oscar Pistorius had, or his parents actually, made the decision for him when he was a very young child to have that elective uh, amputation simply because of the way he was born, and because the fact that if he had undergone the amputation as he did, he actually had better prospects of walking and standing up on his own feet, etc. Exactly, yeah, and and you wouldn't you wouldn't want anyone to be denied that. You'd never want to deny anyone that. That that would just be so cruel, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, to be able-bodied and to say, well, just for the sake of winning a race, I'm going to take both my legs and have them cut off. It, yeah, it doesn't sit well with me. I don't, on a, on a personal basis, my, I don't see that as fair play. So what should we do about it? Should we do anything about it? Because... I, th- I think if you legislate against it, people will try and push it. If you legislate for it, people will protest against it. If we evolve... Hopefully, we'll be sensible enough to find our own sort of level of acceptance where, where you know, this pe- these people are happy, these people are happy, uh, religious people are happy, scientific people are happy. But, you know, we, we need to be smart enough to, to find our own level of what we think is acceptable rather than being told mm-hmm. what someone else thinks is acceptable and, and we have to follow. I mean, we're not stupid, we, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this, Nigel. Do you consider the hand to be a part of you now? Or is it a tool or uh, an accessory, like a piece of clothing or a pair of shoes? How? What's the relationship between you and the hand? It's getting better. Um, I've noticed that when, when I don't wear the prosthetic, um, my phantom hand, which is, which is there all the time. Mm-hmm. My phantom hand starts about here. Um, it starts right at the end of my stump. As soon as I put the, the socket on, my hand starts here. And as soon as I put the hand on, my fingers are now all probably that far away from where they should be. So my, my phantom is actually elongating along my arm as I, as I put the socket on. So yeah, it's, um, it's going to be far more intuitive. I think the more you use something, the more you do it over and over and over. Um, I was trying to come up with an example yesterday, and it would be... Um, I'll just get my hand in position. If you were talking to someone with your hands, using your hands, and you were to say, well, it's thus and this, and that, that's a nothing movement. We do that all the time, you know. You know we all do it. It's ten moves with this, you know, just to to achieve 
something really simple. Hopefully with practice, I'll get to the stage where I don't actually have to think about the 10 moves. It will just do it because the 10 moves will become one. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be one. That's what you're doing. You're doing that task and those 10 moves just happen to be what you need to do. To, so it's, it's becoming a lot like that now. You know, the, the more I do something, instead of it, you know, oh, that's, that's 10 moves, that's nine moves, that's eight moves. Now it's, that's one task. Mm -hmm. And those moves just happen to make up that task. So it, it, I'm sure I'm streamlining it somewhere. How long have you been having this hand for now? Um, I got it around about this time last year. Uh, as a, a full, full on prototype. Mm -hmm. uh, very little of it now is still the same. Um, the, the, the springs that control the fingers, uh, they were upgraded. The, the stainless steel inserts were upgraded. The pins across here were upgraded. Mm -hmm. uh, soft, everything has basically been upgraded mm -hmm. as the hand effectively is evolving. I mean, what they're trying to do is, a million years, two million years of evolution. Yeah. And they're, they're trying to put it together in you know, a very short period of time. And considering that, they've done a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, is the hand available to the public for other people who may have been, who may find themselves in a similar position like you? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I asked uh, just a couple of days ago, I said, how many of these are actually getting out mm -hmm. to, to, to people who need them? Uh, and I was told they're looking at, I think it's around about 200 now. Mm -hmm. So it's gone up from seven, which it was last year. Uh, and, and now it's up at 200 people. So it is available. Um, we have a couple of guys in England who, who managed to get theirs supplied by the, the National Health Service, mm -hmm. um, which is a wonderful thing. That, that's something I, I'm really, really pleased about. Um, I know of a guy in Canada um, who managed to get his with his medical insurance. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's available with medical insurance in the States. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually available throughout Europe as well on the same basis. So it's, it's, it's there. So hopefully in many countries it would be part of the, the sort of healthcare or medical insurance system. But for those who have to... Uh, who have no other option but to buy the hand? How how much is the cost of it? How much is a hand like that? Um, well, again, I was told that this the hand unit is probably about fifteen thousand dollars. Is what I was told. I, I think over in the UK it's around about fifteen thousand mm pounds. -hmm. So I guess it depends where you go. Mm -hmm. But uh, the whole thing, um, I would imagine. With a wrist, etc., etc., it's going to be around about twenty, twenty-five thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. But you know, the the reality of that is, um, at the moment, you would be prescribed with a, a passive mannequin arm that did nothing. You would follow that up probably with a body-powered harness and several attachments to allow you to do various functions throughout the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you might get a myoelectric top prosthesis. This one, yeah, there are two guys who've got them, so they are there. But if you work out the budget for those first four sets of prosthetics and the time you spend with the prosthesis and the hospital time that you use <clears throat> and the time you spend away from either work or home, the cost starts to mount up. Yeah. And then you're looking at something that's actually pretty cost effective. If I can, I think the idea for the for steepers, basically, once you buy this unit, it will work for X number of years, and then you replace it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, if you can afford it, or if, if it's yeah. covered. If it's covered, yeah. Hopefully, it should be covered. Well, and I think also, if um, if they ever get to a situation where they can, you know, mass produce these things, and, and you know, large volume, obviously, is going to drop the price. Mm -hmm. And the, the same with the sockets. I mean, once... I think once the, the services that are around start really getting to terms with sort of new socket technology, and, yeah. and then then you're going to see that people are going to expect more from their prosthetic limb, and that will drive technology forward, and it will drive development. 
Absolutely. Yeah. My my hope is that you know right now you're talking about about two hundred. That's very low scale. My hope is that once you're able, and, and therefore the price will be twenty twenty five thousand dollars. My hope is that when they're able to scale it, usually scaling gives you a factor of twenty or thirty uh, improvement of cost, uh, and therefore I'm hoping that within a few years, and I may be wrong, but that's my hope. If you scale it into the thousands, the hands hopefully will drop to about the thousand dollar level, which would be much more affordable. Yeah, and it, I mean, come on, how do you, how do you put the price on a hand? Yes, you know, if all those those tiny, seemingly insignificant things that you do with your supporting hand, you know, that you you just take for granted uh, until the hand's gone. Um, for myself, because I had, like I say, a, a lot of trouble getting a prosthetic to fit, uh, the downside of that was I did everything with this hand. And all the experts said, oh, that's your super limb. Oh, you can do everything anyone else can do. Mm-hmm. And I promptly ripped all the tendons and ligaments away from the elbow and got myself about, I ran about 85% tendon damage to my elbow. Um, that's four years ago, and I still have physiotherapy every month. So, again, if you get somebody, a a new amputee, if you get them a functional, working, comfortable, good-looking piece of equipment straight away, instead of waiting a couple of years, they're not likely to damage the remaining limb. Mm -hmm. You know, you can offset all these other knock-on effects. I don't think they... The system we have in this country doesn't allow holistic treatment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that's maybe where they should be looking more towards holistic and then mass producing and getting them out to e- these type of limbs to everyone and maybe having the hook as a last resort. Mm-hmm. Having the hook for someone who, look, I don't have the muscle, I don't have the nerve, I don't have the length of bone, I don't have that ability to use a bionic hand. Then the hook. Not Hook first, and if you're lucky, something that people in the street don't shy away from. Mm-hmm. Now, and, and, and again, going back to the psychological dimensions of the issue, you can't put a price to the psychological benefits of it as we talked. And, and more importantly, that sort of a delay or, or gap period between the injury and getting a, a, a functional, good-looking, proper hand like this... Uh, is a is a period in which people undergo enormous psychological trauma, right? Yeah, I imagine. I imagine. Uh, I went to a very very dark place. I went I went to a very dark place where um, I was once asked, "Where do you see yourself in six months' time?" And I wasn't being dramatic. I was being honest. I said, uh, "In a field." with a hose pipe attached to the exhaust of my car. That was as far as I could see. Um, if I was pushed, normally I wouldn't look past the next day. It was, just, it was just a case of trying to get through this day, trying to get through this day, trying to cope with what's going on. Um, the injury itself is, is tough to deal with. Uh, other people's attitude towards you is tougher. Um, you're treated either with kid gloves or you're totally ignored because people, they don't know what to say. They don't know how to say. They don't know if they should say. They're frightened of offending people. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to chop me on the arm off? I don't think so. You know? So you do go to a dark place where you feel you're not wanted. Um, you feel you're not worthwhile. Um, you feel perhaps you're a bullet definitely feel your burden on other people, that they'd be better off without you. Or this this is going through your head day after day. And I think if if it's a sudden traumatic amputation to somebody, for example, like your, your wounded warriors and stuff in America, um, the, the Health for Heroes people in this country, if you're a, a fully fit young serviceman, who's used to being really, really active, and then suddenly, bang, no legs. That's, that's tough to deal with. You know, all the things you used to do, you may never do again. I mean, the, the fortunate thing for these guys is they're so young, they're still unstoppable. They, they still think, 
it's no big deal. But I think, um, you know, psychologically, it, it takes you to places where I really wouldn't want to go back to, you know. How long did you spend between the injury and getting the, the, the bibionic hand? Uh, the injury was the end of 2006. Um, I elected for the amputation uh, at around about April or May of 2007. And I got this last June, so we were five years. Five years. years. Yeah. And in that time, I, I, I think I tried working, but again, I damaged this. Um, my leg was weak from operations to repair my arm. I didn't exercise. Very depressed. Flashbacks. Uh, awful lot of medication. Heart attack. Heart attack? Yeah. Wow. You know, I was doing, I was doing the splits. You know, I was able to do the splits. I was able to kick at my son's head height, six foot plus. And it's martial arts. Yeah. And then suddenly, bang, heart attack. Um, yeah, that was, that was tough. I think had, perhaps I had a, a fully functional limb. Perhaps had I been back in the fold, back in the loop. Perhaps the, the psychological benefits that I, I'm feeling now, perhaps all of that together would have had me back at work. If I'd have been back at work, I would have been getting the exercise, would have perhaps lessened the depression, maybe wouldn't have had the heart attack. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's one of those. So it's fair to say that that can't change your life for the better, suddenly from being depressed and sort of down to perhaps hopefully being able to live fully again. Yeah, I mean, um, <sighs> is that a fair thing to say that you're able to to live fully now? I don't think I'll ever live the way I did. I don't think I'll ever. Um, I don't think in my lifetime I'll be able to do the stuff I used to do before the accident. You know, some of the things, you know, even silly little things. You know, um, a jazz riff on a piano. I think I don't think I'll ever be able to do that again. Uh, blowing out some bomb notes on a saxophone, I won't ever do that again. Because of the the, the, the functionality of the human hand. Mm-hmm. Um, these type of things weren't made for people like me. They were made for people like you. But you know what? Let me let me try and see if I can give you some hope here. You know, I've interviewed about 110 people so far, some of the world's foremost experts in all kinds of fields and disciplines. And I can give you a number of examples of things that are being at lab level right now uh, with respect to synthetic biology, 3D uh, bioprinting of organs, which eventually will turn out into whole limbs. And, And so I would say don't despair, my friend, because first of all, technology, the way it works, your hand would be getting better and better every year from now on. So you're just starting. Your hand would improve, it would be more functional, lighter, more capable and cheaper and more accessible for people across the world. That's what technology does. That's the important thing. But not only that, I would say there will be a time in your lifetime where you would be able to clone the reverse image of your other hand and should you choose to do so, perhaps hopefully replace your bionic hand with a biological hand again. And that means that, again, you may be able to do martial arts, play the piano, play the saxophone, uh, or enjoy whatever you want to enjoy. So I'd say stay optimistic, because I've seen, I've talked to many people, I've seen the technology. We're still in the early stages. It may take a decade, may take a decade and a half or two decades, but it would definitely be in your lifetime. Cool. Well, if I'm around and they want a guinea pig, hi, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel, it's, it's, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you, but time is advancing and we're coming towards the end of our interview. Let me just ask you the last couple of questions here. Uh, but before that, is there any other functionalities that you'd like to have in the next model of your hand that you don't have right now? Yeah, I'd really like some sort of... Uh sensory feedback. Mm. Um, people have said, 
oh, the noise, you can hear it beeping and you hear the air. Well, I think they don't understand that because I have no sensory feedback. I use the noise to tell me when the hand's moving. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm now exchanging the sense of touch to, for the sense of hearing or the sense of sight. I, I look at the hand or I listen to it. Mm-hmm. That's how I know it's working because I don't have that, that sensory feedback. Mm-hmm. That would be kind of cool. Um, if you had, for example, some sort of sensory feedback in the, in the back of the hand, well, if you bang the back of your hand into something like a sharp corner. Yeah, you'll yeah, feel it. It hurts. Yes. Right? So you don't do that again. With a prosthetic hand, you don't feel it. So there is a good chance that next time you'll bang your hand. Next time, if you could get a feedback, you think, oh, hang on. And maybe you wouldn't bang your hand. The, the upshot of that is more life in, in the life of a, a prosthetic hand. You wouldn't knock things off so much, perhaps. They wouldn't have to be so robust. Consequently, they wouldn't have to be so heavy. Consequently, they could be faster. So everything has a knock-on effect. So for me, some sort of sensory feedback and the waterproofing. Mm-hmm. The water. Because, yeah, because, I mean, this is it's too cool to take off. You know, I have to take <laughs> it off. You know, I have to take it off to bathe. Yeah. Uh, and once my arm's off, then I'm, I'm a disabled person. Mm-hmm. I'm reliant on other people to wash me because I can't, there are places I can't get to. Mm-hmm. And so I, I then become dependent on someone else to exist. And I think that's something that, you know, that would be something to strive to eradicate the, the, the need for people like myself, amputees, to have to rely on other people. As I said before, you know, it would be nice to have an opportunity to stand on our own two feet. Yeah. It's, it's pun and it's corny, but it's a reality, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nigel, um, what is the most important way that you think you have changed since the accident, since going through that very tough period of five years and since getting the new hand. I mean, there's been probably a hell of a roller coaster ride throughout that time frame. What's the, the biggest change that you think from your own point of view has happened in you? Um, I would say in the last 12 months since I, I got the B bionic, smiling. Smiling is the biggest change. Um, I'm, I don't think there's a photograph of me in existence from the date of my accident until the date I got my arm. I don't think a photograph exists with me with a a proper happy smile. Um, That, that's the main difference. It's it's made me smile. That's amazing. (laughs) Okay, uh, where can people find more about you uh, if they want to? Uh, I don't know. I'm on YouTube, um, but that's that's about it. Like I say, I mean, I've, technology in me is it's strange. Um, it's almost like I'm a, a technophobic cyborg, which is quite strange. I I don't have a smartphone, you know. I don't have an iPod. It's and today I, is I, the first Skype conversation you ever yeah, made. First, yeah, first Skype video. It's so um, I don't have websites or blog spots and. YouTube's and Twitter's. I, I don't know how they work. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. No, that's but I, totally I would imagine, you know, the, I read the comments on, on the YouTube videos and, and, you know, if there's some good comments there, I'll, I'll, I'll answer. That's what I tell you. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the YouTube videos, I've published three or four of them on my blog so far. And speaking of uh, sensory feedback, I was wondering, how did you manage to hold the eggs if you don't have, I was thinking about that in one of the videos. You're cracking eggs, and I was wondering. Okay, so he doesn't have the sensory feedback. How does he know to stop without crushing the egg, but why, still holding it tightly? How? Yeah, it's, um, it just—I don't know. Because the the video of me doing the eggs that was that was the first time I'd done that. Mm-hmm. Actually, to to do this thing. Uh, I thought I'd just, the guy said, can you do it? And I said, well, I'll, I'll try. Mm-hmm. 
And it, I use my eyes a lot. I watch what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you do get a sort of, a sort of clunk when you, when you grab something because there is, there is slight movement in, in the uh, prosthetic. Mm-hmm. But it, it's predominantly using my eyes. Um, I think if I came in on a full grip, it, it's, it's going to crush the egg. No, but that, that's just my eyes and the way I'm, I'm, I'm judging what I'm doing. That's mm-hmm. practice, I guess. Mm-hmm. Nigel, the, the very last question that I always ask of guests on my show is always the same. And that is, what is the one thing, the most important thing that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from this conversation with you and me today? I would say that... For, from an amputee's perspective, if you if you see me in the street without my arm, come and speak to me. If you make eye contact with me, don't shy away. Don't feel guilty about it or whatever. Just smile. We'll, we'll talk. You know, amputees we're, we're humans, just like just like you. And uh, if you have people scowl at you 50, 60 times a day, you don't want to go out. So if you see us in the street, yeah, we look different. But, you know, smile, wave, hi, how's it going? It would make, make a world of difference. Nigel Auckland, I know you made a world of a difference for the audience in GF 2045 and even for me today just talking to you over uh, the ocean and, and over the Internet indirectly electronically but still I, I moved again and I again would argue that you are not ordinary but you are extraordinary my friend thank you very much thank you and I, I look forward to meeting you again